The message this morning is a title and, and, and a topic that I try to stay away from for quite a long time, the deception of the nations. When you speak of the deception of the enemy, you always have to prepare yourself for trouble when you deal with it. And you know that the media is very much into, in his hands. I call them the media knights. And you know that they can brainwash people in a very effective way. And the Bible says that Satan's name is the prince of the air, which is using the airwaves to broadcast a lot of deception all over the world, non-stop. And it's very interesting because you're probably asking yourself, are you going to talk about uh, the elections in Israel? No, I'm not. All right. So, <laughs> just one thing. Just one thing. I want you to know that um, in spite of s hundreds of millions that were poured by your own administration, by European countries, by other um, non-profit organizations that were established for that purpose alone, against all odds, and even with some very, um, I will call it, um, uh, false polls that were published a few days before the elections just to show that there is a momentum on the other side, Benjamin Netanyahu won the election in what we call a landslide victory. Now, you probably know that he was here in your country, probably at that time doing a better job in his campaign than over there back in Israel. He was here unveiling a big scam, a big deception. He was here unveiling the um, horrible collaboration of the nations of the world to accept a treaty that eventually not only will not prevent any war, but accel accelerate it. You know, Winston Churchill said in 1938, just five years after Adolf Hitler won his elections, Winston Churchill said to his best friend, Lord Moyne, concerning the German problem over the last five years, I have a very big concern that before us we have two choices, shame and war. And I feel that we're about to choose shame and then war will be thrown at our doorpost in a much more adverse terms than in the beginning. When something begins in sin and deception, when, when the truth is not being told to people, then it's not going to last forever. And it's interesting because people around the world, while being brainwashed by the media, they're asking themselves, what in the world is going on? We thought that Israel is smarter and they would get rid of that Hardliner, right-wing Netanyahu. Well, don't they want peace and security, people are asking? Don't they want hope and prosperity? Don't they want to be accepted by the families of the world, by the nations of the world? You know, a lot of Israelis, actually, the slogan of the other camp that was fighting Netanyahu was, let's have hope. Let's have, let's have, uh, um, let be changed, let be accepted by the world. That was it. Quite interesting, isn't it? You, you know, Adolf Hitler said, and for me, Hitler represents Satan incarnated. And he said, if you tell a big enough lie and you tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. He also said, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. He also continued and said, by the skillful and sustained use of propaganda, one can make people see even heaven as hell or an extremely wretched life as paradise. And he also said, it is not truth that matters, but victory. It's interesting because... Uh, all of that, all of that, I felt on my skin, in my flesh. I felt it throughout these elections. The Israelis have never been better, doing better financially, even security-wise. We are stronger than ever. And yet they sold us 
that there is despair. They sold us that we have no hope. They sold us that we're not secured, that we need to change, that we have to be accepted because someone in the White House is not happy with us. They sold us so much lies and deception. And, 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 and the, the slogan was victory 2015. Doesn't matter the facts. Doesn't matter the truth. Victory is more important. Doesn't matter that you're doing good. To everyone, you know, you know people have, have a much better life than they had 10 years ago, 15 years ago. No, we're going to paint it as if everything is horrible. And we're going to paint it as, as, as um, heaven will look like hell. Wow. And you see, Satan is the master deceiver. Now, what is it to be a deceiver, by the way? To be a deceiver is to know the truth and choose to tell somebody the opposite. Because if you know the truth, oh, excuse me, if you don't know the truth and tell something wrong, then you're just wrong. But when you know the truth, when you know the truth and yet you tell somebody, somebody the opposite, that makes you a deceiver. And so when Satan is called the great deceiver, that means he knows exactly that whatever he tells the world is not true. And there's two types of deceptions that I can, can see in the world. There is the global deception, the deception of the whole world. And we're going to see it. We are seeing it. Talking about global economy, global religion, global government. We're talking about a world leader that will rise. This will be a worldwide deception. Whether Jews or Gentiles, everybody will be deceived. Jews will think he is the Messiah. Gentiles will think he is a great leader. Everybody will follow him. It's the deception of the whole world. Yet, do not be mistaken, there is another type of deception often being overlooked. And it's the deception of the nations. What do I mean? The deception of the goyim, of the other nations, not of Israel. Wow, wait a minute, can you see that in the scriptures? Of course I can. In Revelation 12, when it, dis it talks about the battle between Michael and, uh, and Satan itself, the Bible says a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought. And then he goes and he says, so the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That's what um, Revelation 12 talks about. Now, in a very interesting manner, when we're introduced to Satan and how he fell from heaven, how God casted him all the way down, in Isaiah 14, the Bible says, How you're fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. Wow. It's not about the whole world. The nations. He weakens the nation. How can you weaken someone? It's by selling him the lie, deception. When you have the truth, you can decide in a much better way of what your next step is. But when your whole decision-making process is based on deception and you're not aware of it, you're weak. And Satan is weakening the nations. Weakening the nations, how come? When he turn them against his people. Now watch this. If Revelation 12 talked about the deception of the whole world, Revelation 20 says, and I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to a bottomless pit. That's just before the, the uh, thousand years millennial kingdom. And then he says, and he cast into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. That so that he should deceive the nations no more. If you continue that passage, after a thousand years, Satan will be released for a short time. And the first thing he will do is go out and deceive the nations once again. Quite amazing. That's all he does. That's 24-7 job, to deceive the nations. And the nations is not Israel. When he wants to talk about Israel and the nations, he talks about the whole world. When he wants to talk about the nations, he says the nations. The Greek word in the New Testament for nations is ethne, from ethnos, ethnic. 
Many nations, ethnen, the plural. In the Hebrew, goy is a nation. Goyim is in plural, nations. In Joel, we talk about how God will gather all the nations, goyim. In Matthew 25, it's how Jesus will gather all the nations, ethne. And these are exactly the same. The nations are not Israel. So when Satan deceives the nations and not Israel, it is because Israel is the object, is the subject of the deception. The deception is concerning Israel. That may cause you to understand why the Israelis did not buy the lie that the media was trying to sell them. Sometimes they know some things that the rest of the nations cannot see because they're being blinded. The only people amongst the nations that can see many things in the same way the Jewish people can are the believers in Jesus. The Christians and the Jews in that manner are the only ones that can call the, the, the bluff and, and, and that can see what is planned. Now, it's interesting because, don't be mistaken, Israel is even blinded. But it's a different blindness. The Bible says that it is God who blinds Israel. He's the one who gives them eyes that cannot see and ears that they cannot hear until this very day. And why is that? So through their disobedience, through their fall, in order to provoke them to jealousy, salvation will be given to the Gentiles. It's amazing. And it's all written in Romans chapter 11. So what is the deception that Satan is trying to pull out and deceive the nations about Israel? First, Israel is not God's people. Some will say Israel is not God people, God's people anymore. They will add that because maybe they were once, they're no longer. Second one, the land's real name is not Israel, it's Palestine. You know, you can ask uh, most of the people on this planet, they'll tell you that this is it. In fact, your own Bible in the map section will show you that Israel at the time of Jesus was called Palestine, which is a big lie. It's in your Bible. The Arabs were there first. We'll examine that. The occupation is the problem. That's something I keep hearing every time I travel. Everybody around says, the occupation is the trouble. End the occupation. Occupa what occupation? Of what? Peace in the Middle East is possible. They're selling us delusion that there can be peace achieved. They're telling Netanyahu, if you're not going to admit that the solution of two states is the only solution, then we will act um, uh, upon it in the UN and we will vote for two states for two people. That's what the American administration just made it very clear to Netanyahu 24 hours ago. I don't envy you. Well, what about Israel is God's God's, it's not God's people. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 14, 2, For you are holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be people for his own possessions out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Amen. I guess that's what the Bible says. I guess this is what God says. Well, that's not enough. I can read to you in, 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 in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 12. For thus is the Lord of hosts. He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Wow. wow. God sent the prophet to the nations. And he's warning them. He that touches Israel is touching the apple of my eye. And you know what? We are a weak nation. When it comes to... Being hated. Nobody wants to be hated. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everyone, everybody wants to, be, to have their 10 minutes of fame and glory in their life. Israel wants to be part of the, of the family of the world. And a lot of people were somehow convinced that we need to maybe concede to all the, 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 the things that the world is telling us in order to be part of it. The Jewish people in general, and my grandparents are part of it because they survived Auschwitz, they thought that God really forsook them. So if God is not on our side, we need America on our side. We need Europe on our side. We need some, some great nation on our side. 
Well, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. And God says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. That's what God said. Now, you can say whatever you want. These are the words of God. And I'm not here to preach politics. We are here to examine the word of God. And then in Romans 11, if you think, okay, but that's Old Testament. Now we are Christians. We believe in Jesus. Jesus is Christian. He's not Jewish. (laughs) You know that God is not Jewish. God is not Jewish. But Jesus is also not Christian. Did you know that? He never, ever preached from the New Testament even once. Jesus is not a follower of Jesus. Christian is a follower of Jesus. So Jesus is not a Christian. If anything, he came to the world as a Jew. But what I'm trying to say is that in Romans 11, when Paul, who was sent to the Gentiles, was telling them of all the great things that God is now doing to the Gentiles, they... He immediately saw, okay, now they think that Israel is no longer God's people. And then he said in Romans 11, 1, then I said then, has God cast away his people because they kind of rejected him? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast cast away his people whom he foreknew. Period. If God forgot his people, he can forget You, you need to hold on to this verse. Because if God is faithful to his promises to Israel, he surely will be faithful to his promises to you. If he is able to break his covenant and to break his promises, then he might be able to do it to you also. That's not my God. What about the land Palestine and not Israel? (laughs) You know, look at your Bibles and see. You can find it in the map section. It says Palestine in Christ's time. You'll see that. Most of the Bibles have it. Well, just so you know, historically, that it's not true. In the time of Jesus, the land was not called Palestine. If anything, in Matthew 2, verses 19 through 21, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. And then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. It's a very boring verse. Think about it. Not much. Arise, take the son, and take the mother, go to the land of Israel. Okay. So he arise, took the son and the mother, and went to the land of Israel. It's very simple. Yet we see here a truth. The land was called Israel. That's the name. I apologize if I offend you. But that's the name. Not only in the Old Testament, surely in the New Testament as well. And I want you to know that even in, in, in much later, when the Lord spoke through the prophet about What he is about to do with Israel, when he is about to restore them from the ashes of the Holocaust and bring them back to their land, he said to uh, Ezekiel, son of man, these born are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are being cut off. And therefore prophesy and say to them, thus is the Lord God. Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. That's what Ezekiel says about the return of the Jews 2,000 years later back to their land. He didn't say Palestine. It's not in the New Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. So where in the world this name came from? In 135 AD, when Caesar Adrian wanted to completely oppress and suppress the second Jewish revolt against the Romans... In an effort to wipe out all memory of the bond between the Jews and their land, Adrian changed the name of the province from Judea, Judea, to Syria, Palestina, Palestine, a name that became common in non-Jewish literature. And it's actually named after the Philistines, the old foes of the Israelites. But by the way, the Philistines were not Arabs. The Philistines were people from the Greek Isles, if anything. And the Philistines... We're called in the Hebrew, plishtim. And take a look at those three letters, 
P, L, and S in the Hebrew, Pei, Lamed, Shin, it is the root of the word to invade, the invaders. When you call yourself a Philistine, or when you call your land Palestine, named after the Philistines, what are you actually testifying of yourself? That you're the invader. It's not yours. By the way, the name Palestine became so, uh, so um, often used by the whole world that Israel's name was forgotten. That was exactly what the enemy wanted, that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. Read Psalm 83. Why am I saying that? Because for the most part, it is the Jews that were called Palestinians and not the Arabs. I want you to see, this is the Jerusalem Post of before 1948. It was called the Palestine Post. I want you to see to the left, the Israeli Philharmonic used to be called the Palestine Orchestra, Jewish Orchestra. It's the whole program is in Hebrew. And if anything, the Jews who joined the British army to fight in World War II, the Nazi Germany, they were called the Palestinian Brigade. There were Jews and there were Arabs, and all of them were called Palestinians then. In fact, there was, for every three Jews, there was one Arab in that military unit. So if anything, the Jews had more rights to call themselves Palestinians than the Arabs. But why is it that they don't call themselves Palestinians? Because that's not the name of the land, and that's not the name of that nation. Okay, but, but you know what? But the Arabs were there first. Really? Well, let me educate you. First of all, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 20, Nehemiah is leaving Babylon. He's on his way, excuse me, Persia, and he's on his way out to the land of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the walls and the temple. And the, and the king gave him all the, the, the manpower as well as, as the material. And he, along the way, he bumped into three people, an Ammonite, a Moabite, and an Arab. Geshem the Arab, Tobiah the Ammonite, and uh, someone else. Senbalat the Horonite. Thank you. And when they saw him leaving through the main door <laughs> with everything that was given to him by the king, they thought, ah, oh, we know your heart. You're going over there because you're going to start a rebellion against the king. And he looked at them and he says, rebellion? <laughs> I'm not doing that for nothing. I'm leaving all this wealth. I'm the advisor of the king. I could be whatever I want. I'm leaving everything. I go to where I belong. I go to the land of my fathers. And he said to them, God of heaven will prosper us. And therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build but you, Arabs, Horonites, Ammonites, you, you have no portion or right or memorial, in, in the other translation, or heritage in Jerusalem. Wow. Nehemiah was a short guy, Nehi. Think about it. The guy just told the, the Arabs and all the surrounding nations around Israel, you have no heritage, no memorial, no right, and no portion in Jerusalem. It's not yours. It's ours. I'm going back to rebuild it. Wow. How many of you heard of Samuel Langhorne uh, Clements? Known as Mark Twain. Well, funny guy. Look at him. Mark Twain visited Israel in 1867. And he published his impressions in The Innocents Abroad. It's a very famous diary. And he described a desolate country, devoid of both vegetation and human population. In 1867, he walked through the coast of Israel. He didn't even see a living soul. People are telling me that the Arabs were there before. There was no one there. Look at him. He says, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse. A desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route. Hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of the wilderness soil, had almost deserted this country. Wow. 
Well, I will definitely not use him to promote Israel tours. <laughs> but think about it. The guy saw no one because there were no one there. Think about it. I don't know if you've heard of Joan Peters. Joan Peters, she just died two months ago. Amazing woman. American woman, Jewish by birth, who was a very liberal media person. Sounds familiar? Jewish, liberal, media. I mean, she got it all in one package. And, and, and she was a CBS News producer of documentaries and an author who served as White House advisor on American foreign policy in the Middle East during the Carter administration. And the Carter, Carter administration paid her an advance payment to go and write a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict justifying the Palestinian cause. They dictated to her, go, you know exactly that the Jews took the land for the Palestinians. You know exactly that the Arabs were there before. Just write a book. You're a Jewish person. That will give it a great, great credibility. Well, she took the advance payment. Hello. And she made it to the land. And she started digging and digging. And she eventually got into the UN archive. And she was shocked. And when she realized that what she is seeing and finding is completely different than what everybody is singing all around her, she returned the advance payment and she said, no, thank you. I'll write the book myself the way I see it. And she wrote the book called From Time Immemorial, published in 1984. It's a must book for every Christian. And then it sa she says there that prior to the massive immigration of European Jews to Palestine in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the land was mostly barren and underpopulated. The newly arrived Jews brought great prosperity, which attracted a large number of Arabs from neighboring lands who then moved to Palestine to share in the fruit of Jewish in ingenuity and wealth. And as a result, many of the people who call them Palestinians today are actually descendants of these relatively recent economic immigrants. Think about it. A war between, uh, I don't know, America and Venezuela. All right? Think about it. Prior to that war, people from Venezuela, why do I go that far? America and Mexico, okay? <laughs> people cross from Tijuana to San Diego, they find a job, never mind if it's legal or illegal. They find a job, a war broke out, and now they declare themselves as uh, refugees. Refugees where? From San Diego. They, wait a minute, two years ago you just arrived. Yeah, but I'm from San Diego now. <laughs> Interesting, she found out that the, under the pressure of the Arab world, the UN changed the criteria by which someone is called a refugee and lowered it from time immemorial to two years only, just to fit the Palestinian agenda, so they will be called refugees. She also found out that the United Nations Relief and Work Association that was founded by the UN only for the Palestinians, not anywhere else around the world, is giving money more than the average salary in Lebanon. So hundreds of thousands registered as refugees just to get the money. So you see, the whole thing is faded, number-wise. Factually, he's wrong. Now, you're going to say, well, of course, she's Jewish. She came to Israel. She was influenced. What are you talking about? Of course, it's a big Jewish propaganda. Well, let me tell you what, what Zuhair Muhsin, the Palestinian leader of the pro-Syria al saika fraction of the PLO, who was there between 1971 and 1979, in March of 1977, he was interviewed to a Dutch newspaper called Tro, and he said, between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese, there are no differences. We're all part of one people, the Arab nation. Look, I have family members with Palestinians, Lebanese, Jordanians, Syrian citizenship. Citizenship means they're from there originally. And then he said, we are one people. Just for political reasons, we carefully underwrite our Palestinian identity because it is of national interest for the Arabs to advocate the existence of Palestinians to balance Zionism. 
Yes, the existence of a separate Palestinian identity exists only for tactical reasons. The establishment of a Palestinian state is a new tool to continue the fight against Israel and for Arab unity. Says who? Palestinian leader. <laughs> so you're asking me why is it that the Israelis are not buying the idea of two states? We know exactly what's going to happen the next day. And then people say, well, the occupation is the problem. You came, they were there, you occupy their territory. Well, excuse me, we, we did not show up just like that. In 1917, Lord Balfour wrote to, Lord, to um, Edmund de Rothschild, the leader of the Jewish Congress, and he, he wrote to him and he said, Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following uh, declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspiration, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a, a national home for the Jewish people. Wow. Amazing. 1917. And then World War II ended. 1922, the League of Nations gives the British our government a book called The Mandate. The Mandate for Palestine, the League of Nations. And in the mandate, the British government was actually said, uh, uh, to include national home for Jewish people under direct British rule. In other words, the British were given an instruction, go and prepare Palestine to be the homeland of the Jewish people. So when we came, we were actually came legally under the auspices of the whole world, approving that this is the land of Israel for the people of Israel. Amen. In 1948, by the way, Israel was attacked by five Arab nations, and we did not have the West Bank. We did not have Gaza. We did not have uh, the Golan Heights or Sinai. None of these disputed territories were part of Israel at that time. Yet we were attacked. So it's not the occupation. It's our very existence. The PLO was not established in 1967. The Palestine Liberation Organization is established in 1964. Way before we had the West Bank and Gaza. So they did not really want to liberate the West Bank. Look at their map. On their emblem, on their logo, is the entire state of Israel. And you know what? People are saying, ah, why can't you just evacuate that piece of land, let them live their life, and everything will be great. Really? Well, the last time we did it, in 2005, when Israel pulled all the Israelis from Gaza Strip, and we, it was a heartbreaking thing. Look, all the Israeli soldiers, they, they were given an order, go to the Jewish homes, get all the people out, and destroy their houses. They cried with them. 8,500 people were uprooted from their homes. Homes that they, were, they, they built with the approval of the government. What did we get in return? Gaza is clean from Jews. No more occupation in Gaza. If you say it's the problem, there is no more problem. What did we get in return? Rockets, missiles, mortars, tunnels of terror, wars. We don't get peace, we get more wars. Well, peace in the Middle East is possible. Really? Well, let me tell you something. I'm giving you a secret right now. Don't tell anyone. Promise? The leader of the Muslim Arab world in the early 1900s was named Hussein. He was known as the Sharif of Mecca, the leader of the custodian of all the holy sites for the Muslims, Mecca and Medina. And you know what he wrote in the Qibla? El Qibla is the daily newspaper of Mecca. In 1918, he wrote, the resources of the country are still virgin soil and will be developed by the Jewish immigrants. One of the most amazing things until recent times was that the Palestinian used to leave his country wandering over the high seas in every direction. His native soil could not retain a hold on him. At the same time, we have seen the Jews from foreign countries streaming to Palestine, from Russia, Germany, Austria, Spain, and America. And the cause of causes could not escape those who had a gift of of deeper insight, they knew that the country was for its original sons. Abna il Aslim, 
for all their differences, a sacred and beloved homeland. The return of these exiles to their homeland will prove materially and spiritually an, exa- an experimental school for their brethren who are with them in the fields, factories, trades, and all things connected to the land. He's actually saying it's good for the Jews to come back. This is their land, and that will benefit the Arabs that live there. Wow. That is not a surprise then that a year later, his son Faisal met with a Jewish leader, Chaim Weizmann, who became the the first president of Israel, and they drafted a peace agreement. And in that peace agreement, it was known, the Arabs signed it. That the Arabs would recognize the Balfour Declaration and would encourage large-scale Jewish immigration and settlement in Palestine. Freedom of religion and worship in Palestine was set forth as a fundamental principle. And the Muslims' holy sites were to be under Muslim control. And and the Zionist organization promised to look into the economic possibilities of another Arab state to help it develop its resources. The Arabs said... Palestine is Jewish, but we will sign an agreement with you only if you will help us developing our future country also, which was supposed to be Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, a big one. Can you imagine? They actually allowed the Jews, not only allowed, encouraged the Jews to come back. And they signed the the, the treaty. Look, Chaim Weizmann, and, and in Arabic, Faisal. Wow. But guess what happened? When they came in Paris, Faisal appeared before the peace conference and demanded an Arab state excluding Palestine. And look what happened. The nationalists, under their pressure, he retracted, and that's it. We lost it. We almost had an Arab recognition that the entire Israel is Jewish. And their land is Jordan, Syria. Things could have been much better than what they are now. Golda Meir once said, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but we cannot forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. We will only have peace with Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. And it's profound. If you think about it, how many times was a, 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 a country, sovereign country was offered to them? In 1937, by the... Uh, the, the Peel uh, uh, Commission. 1939, the British mandate. The British white paper proposed it. 1947, the UN. 79, the Camp David Accord. 1990s, the Oslo Agreement. 2000, Ehud Barak offered them a state. 2008, Ehud Olmert offered them a state. They said no. After no, after no. Our first foreign minister once said that the Palestinian never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But the very sad part is that according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, even the Antichrist will not be able to produce peace. See, people want peace. They want prosperity. But even the Antichrist will sign a deal for seven years and will break it three and a half years into it. So the world will sell you that peace is achievable. The world will sell you that there is something on the other side. The world will sell you that a Palestinian state is a solution, that they were there first, that the name is Palestine. The world will sell you everything. But the truth is that there can be no peace in the Middle East until the Prince of Peace will return. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that supporting Israel is not a political stand. It is a biblical one. Amen. Conclusion also is that the deception of the nations started crawling into church doctrines. Did you know that? I just heard on the radio a pastor of a huge church who said that Genesis 12:3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you, is not about Israel. I almost fell off my chair. Couldn't believe it. And it's supposed to be a very pro-Israel. But you see, the deception crawls into doctrines. Interesting. You know, Donald Barnhouse, a very profound uh, theologian and a pastor who passed away in 1960, 
he wrote, when the Greek overran Palestine, he called it Palestine because in his time it wasn't Israel yet, and desecrated the altar of the Jewish temple, they were soon conquered by Rome. When Rome killed Paul and many others and destroyed Jerusalem under Titus, Rome soon fell. Spain was reduced to a fifth-rate nation after the Inquisition against the Jews. Poland fell under the pogroms, after the pogroms. Hitler's Germany went down after its uh, anti-Semitic, never mind. Britain lost her empire when she broke her faith with Israel. All of that, one after the other. Now, do you wish to see more countries on the list? No one wants to. People don't listen. People don't learn the lesson. The deception is still going on. But yet I will say hallelujah anyway. Amen. Why? Because even though the attempt is to wipe out the Jewish people and to destroy them from the face of the earth, God is out there to fulfill his plan. And what the enemy meant for evil, God surely can turn into a good thing. And the nation was born, Israel was born from the ashes of the Holocaust. Only the Holocaust convinced the world that Israel is the place for the Jewish people worldwide. And they voted yay in the UN. And last but not least, if there is one thing I want you to leave this place this morning with, is the understanding that God will judge the nations of the world that came up against Israel. Amen. He will judge them because they came against Israel. You know, not only in the future. Even in the past, in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 25, I read it, and it's quite amazing. He says, look, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against the Ammonite and prophesy against them. Says to the Ammonite and say, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, aha, against my sanctuary, which it was profaned, and against the land of Israel, which it was desolate, and against the house of Israel when they went into captivity. Indeed, therefore I will deliver you as a possession to the men of the east, and they shall set their encampments among you. God will punish. He did punish in the past. Anyone that triumphed over Israel's uh, uh, misery and Israel's uh, judgment, and God will judge in the future. In the book of Joel, chapter 3, the Bible says that he will gather all the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat and he will enter into judgment with them according to one thing. What did you do to my people? And what did you do to my land? That's why Mount of Olives is filled with Jewish graves. All the Jews buried there wants to resurrect and be there when God judges all the nations. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, Behold, all the nations are going to come, and I will separate the sheep from the goats. And what is the criteria by which he is going to separate the sheep from the goats? These are all Gentiles. Some will have eternal life, will be with him. Some will not. The criteria is, what did you do to my brethren, to the least of my brethren? Throughout the tribulation, Gentiles will be tested by their, not faith, but actions. As James chapter 2 verse 14 says, faith without works is not really faith. Not that works save, but you cannot say, I'm a Christian and behead the people of God. So many brave Christians around the world right now are being beheaded, yet they do not retract from their belief. They do not deny Jesus, and they go all the way, especially in the Middle East. And I'm asking you, are you a sheep or a goat? Most likely, if you sit here, you're, you don't have to be concerned, because you'll be raptured with all, with everyone, and we're not here to be throughout the tribulation. But whatever you teach your relatives will affect them being sheep or goats. Because when you're up there, and they're not ready yet, and they are not being raptured, and they're staying here, and they go through the tribulation, maybe one day they will remember what you said. And maybe many Cory Ten Booms will be all around the world at that time. And these are the sheep that will enter his kingdom after those days. And so my prayer is that all of us 
will understand the schemes of the enemy and understand the duty of the Christian to stand up for the truth, even though it's not that popular, and even though it sounds too political. We're not in politics. This is the Word of God. And the politicians will try to make the Word of God irrelevant. Well, they are irrelevant. This is what I trust much more.